Our second section of chapter one will cover subsections 1.4 through 1.6, where we talk first about Lewis structures and then some principles of bonding, including a lot of discussion about orbitals. Okay. Now, Lewis structures are something we've been using for a long time, even in general chemistry. And boy, if you can't do a Lewis structure at this point, you better get crystal clear on everything that's going on with those principles sooner rather than later, because we will be using Lewis structures and other types of structures all the time. Here we see four examples of Lewis structures, some with some formal charges, which you should remember how to calculate as well, right? Formal charge, we have that on the next slide. Here we see water, hydronium ion, hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide. This is great. It helps us identify lone pairs and see how things are bonded. Single bond, double bond, triple bond. And if we have any resonance, okay? But what a Lewis structure doesn't do, for example, is identify the bond angle. So we'll talk about other types of structures that can help with that in a second. I just alluded to formal charge, right? Make sure you remember how, how to calculate that. Number of valence electrons minus the number of lone pair electrons minus the number of bonds, okay? Or your textbook adds those two together first. You may also see the calculation by taking the number of bonding electrons divided by two but that ends up being the same as the number of bonds. But we are largely concerned in both semesters of organic with formal charge uh, because that can control some of our principles of reactivity, whether or not something has a charge, okay? So make sure you know how to calculate these things. And then I show this slide again so that you can go through and actually practice calculating those formal charges, right? And a lot of the times the formal charge is zero and that's good. That's what we want to have. That's the most stable Lewis structure if possible. Right? And on your sapling homework, look out for that. A lot of the times the system will want you to label something with a formal charge of zero. That formal charge also allows us to predict how many bonds things like to have, right? Like carbon, for example, likes to form four bonds. If it doesn't have four bonds, it's going to have a formal charge or be a radical species. And you're probably familiar with that, right? But if not, organic is all about the study of carbon, right? Carbon's gonna form four bonds, nine times out of 10, okay? If not, we'll have a cation, this is specifically called a carbocation, a carbon cation, a carbocation, okay? So we'll see that some this semester. This is called a carbanion, right? A methyl anion there, we'll see that a little bit in organic too. And we won't deal with radicals until we get to chapter 12. Okay, so right now, carbon forms four bonds. What else are we gonna work with a lot? Well, we'll see nitrogen pretty frequently. It likes to form three bonds and have one lone pair okay, because then it has a formal charge of zero. That's not the case, then you're gonna have a formal charge, be it positive or negative, okay? And both of these guys down here have special synthetic utilities. You've seen ammonium already. Oxygen, two bonds, two lone pairs. Doesn't have that, you're gonna have some sort of a formal charge. Okay, so carbon, four, nitrogen, so carbon, four bonds, zero lone pairs. Nitrogen, three bonds, one lone pair. Oxygen, two bonds, two lone pairs. Okay, hydrogen, one bond, that's it. The halogens, one bond, three lone pairs. And that's 95% of what we'll be using in organic, right? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and the halogens. Okay, so chlorine, bromine, fluorine. Right? And if they don't do that, just like everything else, they're gonna have a charge. Okay, and this is a Another way to look at it, right? Number of bonds plus number of lone pairs equals four because that ties into the octet rule. And that's a trick that you can use to kind of quickly identify any mistakes in a structure. But if you're good with everything we just talked about, the number of bonds, you're probably doing all right. So going back to Lewis structures, I already alluded to this, right? We see double bonds, we see triple bonds. I'm hoping all of this is extremely familiar to you. You guys were at the top of your Gen Chem classes, continuing on to organic. Yep. So hopefully Lewis structures are something you're comfortable with. If not, do them for practice, right? If you're not 100% comfortable, 
Here's an example you can stop right here with nitrate. Try and draw the Lewis structure for nitrate. It's a tricky one. Okay? Remember all those rules. Draw the Lewis structure, check your answer. It's coming up on the next slide. Okay? What you might have drawn at first is this structure down here on the left, right? But that doesn't work because it has an incomplete octet. So we end up with something looking right here, right? But that's also not 100% correct because that also has two additional resonance structures. All of them should be contained within brackets with the charge, the net charge outside of minus one. So this is actually incomplete from the textbook provider. So that brings us to other types of structures, right? Practice the Lewis structures if you're not good with them. You'll definitely be seeing them all the time. Okay. So we have something that we also use in organic pretty frequently called a Kekulé structure. And all that is is exactly a Lewis structure, but we just don't show the lone pairs. Okay. So it does show all the bonding. It would show a double bond or a triple bond. It just doesn't show the lone pairs. They're quicker because as we move on, we get more advanced in organic. I'll assume you know where those lone pairs are supposed to be. Okay. Then we have a condensed structure down here. And those things kind of omit showing all the covalent bonds. Right? They just list the atoms that are bonded to a particular carbon going left to right. You just have to know the fact that carbon has four bonds. right? So as we go taking this one in the middle here, right? that carbon has three hydrogens and an oxygen. Right? And that carbon has three hydrogens of the same oxygen. Okay, so this thing is an ether just requires a little bit of intuition. Okay? And again, condensed structures don't show lone pairs. Okay. Right, here's another table from your textbook, 1.5, that shows you Kekulé structures and condensed structures. Okay. Both of these are acceptable ways to show a condensed structure. Sometimes anything that, that's not carbon or hydrogen is shown coming off with a line. These you actually do see more frequently. Okay, this too, where if you've got a repeating series going on for a while, you put the thing in parentheses with how many times it appears. So be familiar with how to draw all these different types of structures. Know the full gauntlet in Lewis, right? Drop the lone pairs, that's Kukule, squish it all together, don't show the bonds, that's condensed. Okay. Here's some other examples. All of these are in your textbook, right? and I recommend you check them out so that you're familiar with all those subtle nuances when you see them in the lecture slides, when you see them in the textbook, and when you see them on your homework or in exams. Uh, but the big part of organic is doing skeletal structures because we draw so many structures throughout the course of semesters, the two semesters. Right, so you have lots of practice on sapling with these guys as well. They're definitely gonna be on your exam, these skeletal structures. And you'll recall we finished Gen Chem 2 at JCC with this intro to organic chapter and practice drawing skeletal structures. Right? And in those skeletal structures, we don't show carbon or hydrogen. Right? Any vertex right, or any point represents, or any terminus represents a carbon. So there's a carbon here, 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 right? here, here, and here bunch of carbons in there, five carbons in a ring here. And so any of those vertex or termini represent a carbon, and you have to know that that carbon has four bonds. So anything that's not carbon or hydrogen will be shown, like the oxygens or the bromines over here, right? but of anything else that's not shown, well, it's just filled in with hydrogen. So if I take this carbon right here, for example, well, it's got a bromine on the right and a carbon on the left, but that's only two bonds, so it must have two more hydrogens. Sure enough, you see it's the CH2 right there. Okay. You do have to show double and triple bonds in skeletal structures. See benzene over here. Right. You do have to show double or triple bonds because otherwise everything would become saturated with all single bonds, extra hydrogens. Okay. So definitely practice, practice, practice these skeletal structures. They're a big part of organic moving forward. Those are all your types of structures. Lewis, Kekulé, condensed, skeletal. Now we go back to orbitals and forming bonds, which is the, what the next part of chapter one is all about in this video and the next one. Yep. Recall your atomic orbitals. 
Okay. Going back to chapter six, when these were first introduced in Gen Chem, but we talked about them in both semesters. But the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle right, tells us that the exact location and the precise momentum of an atomic particle right, can't be simultaneously determined. We can't know them at the same time. So we use atomic orbitals to describe a probable location, right? Where the probability is that we're going to find these things. Yep. So our S orbital is a sphere of probability, right? The 1S right around the nucleus. The 2S also spherical, larger, right? Spherical, but it has that node between the 2S and the 1S, right? See the node there on the bottom right. So an atomic orbital, region of space where we're going to find, most likely going to find an electron. Okay. We also have to recall the fact that electrons behave like waves, okay? Particles and waves. So if it can have constructive or destructive interference, right? There's different ways that these things can combine. And that wave-like particle is the reason that we have nodes. So keep, we're gonna to touch on that more in just a second. S orbital, spherical. P orbital, right? dumbbell shaped. Here we see the two opposite phases in one orbital, okay? With a region of zero probability right there at the middle. So you've got that planar node, right? Region of zero probability. And we've got three p orbitals, one that follows each axis, the x, the y, and the z. Okay. And the p orbital is higher energy than the s orbital because on average, right, it's further away from the nucleus. The electron's further away from the nucleus than it is in an s orbital, right? So they've got a higher potential energy, those two electrostatics, the positive charge in the nucleus and the negative charge in the electron. Okay. So when we form covalent bonds, uh, this happens, we're gonna talk first about molecular orbital theory, or MO theory, which we introduced in chapter eight of Gen Chem. All right? Now our Lewis structures was only treating electrons as particles. We just talked about the fact that they're behaving as a wave, right? And that gives us our molecular orbitals that have sizes, shapes, different energies, okay? So we have to think about how these things come together, okay? Now we are filling our octets, right? We just talked about that rule of eight at the beginning of this video, right? By sharing electrons. That's how we're gonna complete an octet, form a covalent bond. That's what organic is really all about, okay? We're not really talking about things that are ionic, where we're transferring them, okay? And these electrons have wave-like particles. Or sorry, wave-like properties, just getting ahead of myself. And so when we're making a covalent bond and these things come together, we have to think about it. Is it happening in phase or out of phase? Because it's two possibilities. And these molecular orbitals describe that new property. We were looking at atomic orbitals just a second ago. Now we're thinking about a new orbital that belongs to the whole molecule that came from two atomic orbitals coming together to make two new molecular orbitals. So how is that happening, okay? If we're looking at this sigma bond being formed between two S orbitals, right? Monatomic hydrogen, two of them, coming together to form diatomic hydrogen, okay? Two atomic orbitals came together to form, it's just showing one molecular orbital here, but right, we've got orbital conservation. So if two orbitals go in, two come out, the other one's just not shown here. And as these two orbitals come in together to overlap, energy is going to get released, okay? Because you see we're at this energetic minimum here because those electrons are shared between the two nuclei and they're attracted to their original nuclei and the new nuclei. So we reach an energetic minimum. Some energy gets released when a bond is formed. That's old news, okay? And that minimum in energy determines the bond length and the bond association energy, exactly how much was released. Every bond has unique values for that. The BDE, the bond association energy, and the bond length. But as I talked about, these things can come together in phase 
or they can come together out of phase. Right? Here we saw them come together constructively. That's what we need to form a bond, constructive interference. Right? That's when they're both in phase. Okay? But they can also come together destructively, thinking about them behaving like a wave. Okay? And that's going to detract from bonding. Remembering what I just mentioned, right? Orbitals are conserved. The number of new molecular orbitals formed must equal the number of atomic orbitals that went in. Yep. And we're going to get some that are in phase and some that are out of phase, half and half. And if you're not familiar with what constructive or destructive interference look like, right? Khan Academy has some really good videos and they're up on YouTube as well. I don't know if these links are still active or not, but you'll find those in the lecture slide. But let's look at a true molecular orbital diagram. Okay, this is for H2. Okay. S atomic orbital, S atomic orbital. Two atomic orbitals go in, those are on the outside. They form two new molecular orbitals on the inside because the orbitals are conserved. Number of atomic orbitals is equal to the number of new molecular orbitals. Right? This is when they come together in phase. Right? They've come together constructively. Here, they're out of phase. They came together destructively, and there's a node right between those two nuclei. Okay. The antibonding, that's what that's called when they came together destructively, is always higher in energy than is the bonding, the one lower in energy. Okay. So then when we have these two electrons, right, both of the hydrogens contributed one electron, right, they fill according to the Aufbau principle. And just like the atomic orbitals, every new molecular orbital can hold two electrons. And remember the Aufbau principle from the bottom up, lowest energy to highest energy. So the two electrons go into the new bonding molecular orbital and they form a covalent bond. Okay? And that's why we see H2. And no electrons went up into the higher energy antibonding molecular orbital. And I've already mentioned all of this. As we went through, right, the bonding molecular orbital, lower in energy, that's where the electrons are between the nuclei. It helps form a bond. An antibonding molecular orbital has a node between the nuclei, so it detracts from bonding. So if we look at that one more time, right, bonding, lower in energy, antibonding, higher in energy. Okay. But because all of our electrons went to the lower energy, more stable molecular orbital, right, we're going to get a diatomic particle. But if we did the same thing with two helium atoms coming together, well, that would be a different story, right? Because everything combines the same. We get the same type of molecular orbitals, but both of the heliums contributed two electrons. So I have a total of four new electrons to go into my molecular orbitals. One goes into the lower energy bonding, or sorry, two of them go into the lower energy bonding orbital, and two go into the higher energy antibonding orbital. So, right, two in bonding, two in antibonding, there's no net contribution to bonding. Okay? If you recall from chapter eight, you can calculate the bond order by taking the number of bonding minus the number of antibonding electrons divided by two. Okay, so here, 2 minus 2 is 0, divided by 2 is still 0. There's no net contribution to bonding. So we don't see diatomic helium. We know it doesn't exist. That's the same reason why if hydrogen is charged, it's not stable. We don't see H2 plus or H2 minus because then we don't have as strong of a bond between the two. And we can do the same thing with P orbitals, right? forming a pi bond, thinking about side on overlap. Right. A sigma bond came from those s orbitals together. Now we're looking at a pi bond coming from p orbitals. Well, it can happen in phase or it can happen out of phase. Here we get electrons that are contributing to bonding. This would form a pi bond, but if these things have opposite phases, right, and we had electrons up here, it would detract from bonding. So if they're in phase overlap, that's going to give us a pi bond. They're out of phase. That's going to give us an anti-bonding molecular orbital. We're going to use those principles in the next video in section three to continue to talk about how these bonds are formed.
and things like hybridization.